Well, good morning. It is great to see you here this morning. So glad that you have joined us here at Sunlight this morning, uh, either here in the sanctuary or on Facebook or however you're viewing us this morning or later on this week. We want to welcome all of you. It's a great day to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. Did you see that big shiny object outside and there's a little warmth that goes with it? And uh, that's it's good to see. Hey, but it's great to see you. So we want to invite you to go ahead and stand up with us and uh, look around, find somebody that you have not said hi to yet this morning and welcome them into the house this morning. Great to see you today. Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. Amen. If you would remain seeing him this morning and join us now for our time of worship.
Amen. In Psalm 56, verses 11 and following, we find these words from the psalmist, King David. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. And we praise God for his word this morning to us and for this reminder. It is in him we trust. It is in him we hope. It's in him we find our strength and our peace each day, day by day. So as we continue to worship him together this morning, as we prepare for a time of prayer in just a moment, I want to share some requests with you from our church family this day and this week ahead. Now, I want to be in prayer for those that have recently lost loved ones. Uh, keep Roseanne Bauer and the family in your prayers for God's comfort and peace over the Bauer family during this time following Gene's passing and his services yesterday. I want to be in prayer for uh, Leah Shorgen uh, as, uh, as her mom passed away this last week. Keep Leah in your prayers. Uh, as you recall, her dad passed away not too long ago, so keep that family in your prayers. Uh, the viewing is this Tuesday uh, from 5 to 7, and the funeral is this Wednesday at 1 o'clock at Glancy's in Montpelier. So keep, uh, keep Lee and the family in your prayers in these days for God's peace over them during this time. Be in prayer for those that are going in for surgery this week. Uh, Andrea Berkshire is going in for surgery. Uh, Randy Runkle uh, has another surgery coming up tomorrow. Keep Randy in your prayers as well as Yvette and the family during this time for God's healing touch on Randy, that he would do a mighty work in Randy's life. Uh, we praise God that Gene came through surgery, Gene Valage came through surgery this last week and is doing well, and good to see Gene and Susan here, so continue prayers for healing for him. Uh, be in prayer for a young man named Justin, uh, who had an accident this last week and uh, uh, severe burns, so keep Justin in your prayers as well as family uh, during this time for God's healing touch on him. Many more requests, and there's those that are even now sharing online those requests uh, that they have on their hearts. And in just a moment, the altars are going to be open. So we encourage you, as the worship team leads us, if you feel so led, any prayers, any praises that you might have to come. Let's worship them together.
this is our prayer, that you would only give us the grace, give us the strength to trust you more this day. God, even now we pray that you would meet us right where we're at this morning, that you would search our hearts. God, you know, God, you know what we need. You know us intimately. And so for those here this morning, God, for those joining us online, for those joining us even later this week, God, meet us right where we're at in our time of need this morning. God, for those that need a physical touch from you, we pray for healing. God, and, and in cases where, God, we, we don't even know, we don't even know where it's going to come from, we, we trust, we trust that you're in control. And we thank you for that. And God, for those individuals, those families that need your comfort and peace, God, they're even out mourning the loss of loved ones, family and friends. God, we pray, God, for your peace them, for your strength over them in these days. God, for those going in for surgery this week, God, we pray for your will and for a quick and full and complete healing for them. And God, for those this morning who are far from you, God, we pray that today would be the day of salvation, that today would be the day that they come face to face with your truth and with your love and with your grace. So God, may today be the day of salvation and freedom them. God, search our hearts. Have your way. Continue to move in this place this morning. And God, empower us to live life for you this week as we seek to be the light that you've called us to be. So we thank you and we praise you for all these things. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have a quick video for you as Easter approaches. Kids, are you getting excited for that? Yeah. Right, maybe not. I don't. <laughs> Kids, are you getting excited for Easter? Okay, fantastic, fantastic. We're now going to dismiss the kids, ages four up through the fifth grade, go back the, out the exit doors there to my right, your left. So, kids, exciting, exciting things ahead for you. And yes, for parents, grandparents, in just a couple short weeks, that uh, event is going to be taking place uh, here at the church, so, and that's just one of the many things that we do here, um, that uh, we, are, we are grateful for your partnership with us, uh, we're grateful for the ways in which you support the ministries of the church, whether it's through your time, whether it's through your candy donations, whether it's through your tithes uh, and faithful giving, and we wouldn't be able to do all that we do uh, without your generous support, so we thank you for that. Here at Sunlight Wesleyan Church, we're about loving people to Jesus. That's why we exist. That's why we're here. And uh, we're glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. Whether you join us for the very first time, whether you've been with us a long time, we're glad you're here. I want to encourage you now, for those who are with us physically, to go ahead and take out your uh, bulletin. Go ahead and tear off the back flap. Um, that allows you to mark your attendance with us this morning. Also allows us to partner with you, to connect with you uh, with any prayer requests or any praises that you might have. We've got a whole team of folks that pray over these each and every week. And so we encourage you to take a moment at some point during the service this morning, if you haven't already, and complete this. And then at the close of the service, you can either leave it um, in the pew and we'll collect those at the end of the service, or you can deposit these in the baskets in the back next to each one of the exit doors. So we encourage you to take a moment to do that. Um, also want to remind you, uh, we, we no longer uh, pass the plate uh, as far as collection of our tithes and offerings go. We have boxes set up in the back where you can deposit those either during this next worship song or uh, at the close of the service this morning. But we thank you for your generous and, and faithful support for the ministries of the church. Many of you um, take advantage of the uh, electronic giving option, and, and we're very grateful for that as well. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without your faithful support. Finally, just a reminder, next Sunday is uh, Bring Your Pillow to Church. 
Sunday uh, because daylight savings time is, is coming. And uh, so we are going to be here an hour earlier next Sunday morning. So don't forget that. And uh, yeah, if you do need to bring your pillow with you, we, we understand. We understand. So I'm going to pray now for the tithes and offerings before we go any further. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity God, to gather together. We thank you for the opportunity, the privilege of being able to worship you. And uh, to be able to give back, God, uh, even a portion, God, what you have blessed us with. So, God, we pray your blessings over the tithes and offerings, God, collected this morning. And, God, we pray, God, that your blessing over Pastor Lyle as he brings the message to us that you have burdened him to share with us. God, we pray that uh, our ears, our hearts, our minds would be open, God, to receive all that you have for us this morning. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Good morning. Wonderful to see you. I am going to make a confession this morning. 
Uh, I am never going to show up on a poster of physical fitness. Uh, I am never uh, being in the ministry. I'm, I'll just use this as an excuse. I don't get a lot of exercise. Uh, that's on me. But I, we have an elliptical machine in our uh, garage. And uh, during the wintertime, it's really cold out in the garage. And so we didn't use it during the winter. And I, and I tell myself, when it gets warmer, I'm going to use that elliptical. Yesterday, it was warmer. Yesterday morning, I was cleaning up in the garage, and I saw the elliptical sitting there in the corner, and it was calling to me. And I said, okay. I spent 10 minutes on the elliptical yesterday morning. When I got off, I was feeling pretty good. When I got up this morning, <laughs> I couldn't move. <laughs> and so I am avoiding any kind of steps. That's why I came in that way this morning, because it is not pretty. And uh, so uh, just uh, bear with me this morning. But it is great to have you here. And, and now that I've made that confession and got it off my chest, I feel much better now. And uh, so it's good to be with you this morning. I want to let you know that next Sunday we are going to be starting a membership class at the 930 hour. Some of you uh, have been a part of the church for a long time and, and you're not a member. And you say, well, you know, maybe I need to, to become a member. Maybe you're new to the church and you say, well, I want to know a little bit more about the church. Well, we have a membership class that is going to meet for four weeks. It starts next week, 930. And uh, so if you want to be a part of that, just because you go through the membership class does not mean you have to take membership. It's just a time for you to learn more about the church if you would like to. Uh, so we want to invite you to do that starting next Sunday, 930. If you'd like to be a part of that, just mark it on the, the folder that you have this morning or just let us know or speak to me so I can make sure I have all the materials that we need for next Sunday. So that starts next Sunday. Well, we do want to welcome you this morning as we bring to a conclusion our series on the Beatitudes. I pray that you've enjoyed the series. I also pray that we've all learned something from it, something new, or have been reminded of a big biblical truth from our study as well. And today we're going to be looking at the eighth, the final beatitude. It can be found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. So if you have your scriptures with you this morning and want to turn there, I would appreciate that greatly. Well, throughout history, there have been times of persecution against Christians. In Rome, they had the Colosseum that people would gather in and cheer as lions would roam around the center of the ring. Christians would be thrown in with them and ripped to shreds. And all of this took place while Roman citizens stood and cheered and watched not in horror, but in glee as believers were being killed one after another. And while today we do not have coliseums where Christians are thrown to the lions, we still live in a world that is full of all types of persecution that take place. You've heard it said many times during this series that these beatitudes are building blocks that are placed one on top of another. And this beatitude of persecution needed to be the last one where it's at, for if it would have been any other place, it would have never worked. Because in order to get to this beatitude, in order to, to be sustained and to go through this beatitude, we have to have all the others in place. Because the first thing that happens when someone hears the word persecution, our first thought is, how can I get away from that as fast as I can? You have to have all the others before you can come to this last one. So join me as we read from Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 10. And this is what it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now we need to remember that the B attitudes are the qualities, the characteristics that are developed in our lives, making us become more like Jesus. And they are also paradoxical statements of joy, signifying even further that we are becoming more and more like Christ. And if there was ever a beatitude that was a paradox, it has to be this one. How can the persecuted be blessed? 
I can't imagine anyone saying that they're happy to be picked on, they're happy to be beat up on, and, and actually mean what they're saying. No one finds pleasure in pain unless they're just not thinking clearly. Jesus must have known his followers would have a hard time with this statement. Because of, out of all the Beatitudes, this is the only one Jesus repeated for emphasis. Jesus doesn't just say the persecuted are blessed once. Jesus says it twice. And we're even told to rejoice and be glad. And Americans, we find it hard to rejoice and be glad if we have a bad day, let alone if we have to stand in the face of persecution. The Apostle Paul apparently understood what Jesus said. He not only knew it to be true intellectually, but Paul lived what Jesus said. In Acts 16, when Paul was in the city of Philippi, he was overtaken by a mob. He was arrested. He was beaten. He was locked in chains. He was put in prison. This would not be my idea of a good day. Most of us would have been inclined to just want to try to get some sleep, try to escape the pain we were feeling, and hope things looked better in the morning. Yet at about midnight, Paul and his companion Silas were, were not sleeping. They weren't up singing the blues or comparing cuts and bruises or telling sob stories. Instead, these two sore, uncomfortable, weary men were singing praises to God and praying. And years later, Paul would write praise to God and write to the church of Philippi from another prison in Rome where he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The question that may enter our mind after reading this beatitude is this. How can the persecuted be blessed? How can the persecuted be blessed? Well, the answer is that persecution will bring you a blessing when you keep the four R's in mind. Righteousness, reaction, reminder, and reward. You are blessed when persecution is for righteousness. Now, Jesus did not simply say, blessed are the persecuted meaning anyone who gets picked on or poked at is going to be blessed. No, verse 10 says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. The New Living Testament says, blessed are the persecuted because they live for God. Persecution is blessed by God when it comes as a result of righteousness. And if you were with us a few weeks ago, we spoke about righteousness and what that means. And we said that righteousness is first the declaration of God. Righteousness is not based upon anything we can do. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. God says we are righteous through faith in Christ Jesus. The blood of Christ makes it possible for us to be made righteous. And as we come clean before God, confessing our sin with a full knowledge that Jesus paid the death penalty in our place, God declares us righteous. Righteousness is also the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God within us empowers us to live a holy life. And righteousness is not living according to a legalistic set of do's and don'ts. Righteousness is a life lived under the control and the influence of God's Spirit living in you. Righteousness is not forced upon you from the outside, but flows from within you by the dynamic power of God for the world to see. The Christian should live differently from those who are not Christians. The values, the priorities, the goals and desires of the Christian should produce a different lifestyle. The child of God should stick out like a sore thumb compared to the culture of the world or the American culture. Living out the Beatitudes in your daily life means you can't sit on the fence between Christian faith and the values of the world. The Beatitudes are the building blocks to be like Jesus and we live our life consistent with the attitudes, the characteristics and the qualities and the value of Jesus, our life will be different. Ephesians 2.19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Now, at this time in history, we as Christians in America don't face the same kind of persecution as believers in other parts of the world. 
And I believe the reason is that when Christians lose their uniqueness, when we become saturated and overcome with the things of this world to the point that no one can tell who the Christians are and aren't, we no longer live a righteous life and persecution will stop. I mean, think about it for a minute. Satan doesn't need to do anything to you if you're not doing anything to disrupt his mayhem. But as soon as you stand up against him, he'll come at you with both barrels. But too often American Christians focus on God's blessing and forget the price we must be willing to pay. God wants us to consider the cost and the dividends. Last time I checked, you still can't get something for nothing. God wants us to come to Christ with our eyes wide open. Luke 14, 27 and 28 says this, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? You see, Jesus didn't hide anything from us. He told us like it is. He said, if you're going to be my disciple, then expect persecution. And Jesus told us in this life, we can expect persecution instead of praise. We can expect cruel insults instead of cordial invitations. We, we can expect harassment instead of honor, abuse instead of applause, applause, slander instead of support, death instead of dignity. Jesus wants us to be prepared for the difficulties that will come as a result of following him. In John 16, 33, we find these words. It says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The second thing is this. You are blessed when persecution is a reaction to Christ. Jesus says that you're blessed when you endure all kinds of persecution because of him. He tells us in Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. The Christian faith is not a cause. It's not a religion. It, it's not about good works or living a moral life. Christianity is Christ. And our Christian faith is centered around a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When you encounter persecution, you are blessed when you remember it's not you your attackers are outraged with. It's not about you. It's, a, it's about Jesus. In the early days of the Christian church, a zealous young man did everything in his power to bring Christianity to an end. This man had believers arrested, put in prison. He threatened the lives of Christians and approved of them being put to death. However, he stopped hunting down the Christians when he, when he came to the man he hated most. Why did he change? Because he met the risen Christ. And Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? See, Saul was not opposing a group of people. He opposed Jesus. And the same Jesus who had been crucified and lay dead in the grave for three days. But when Jesus was brought back to life and confronted the man who threatened his people, people have continued to resist Jesus. And the Lord wants us to remember that when we encounter persecution, it's not about us. It's about him. John 15, 18 says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Don't be surprised when people despise you or treat you unfairly. As long as they hate Jesus, they will continue to hate you. Number three is this, you are blessed when you recall Jesus's reminder. The last half of verse 12 says this, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus wants us to remember, we are not the only ones who have ever experienced persecution for our faith in God. 
The godless people of the world have always hated Christ and in turn his followers, all of them. And I guess maybe one way to remember that we are not the only one experiencing persecution is to remember that you're not the only one who has ever complained to God about it either. Elijah was a great prophet of God. He had been used mightily by the Lord to call the nation of Israel out of a lifestyle of compromise and pagan worship. And on Mount Carmel, Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to see who served the living God. And it was no contest. I mean, God answered Elijah with fire from heaven. Yet, when Queen Jezebel threatened to have Elijah killed after his great victory over the prophets of Baal, Elijah ran for his life and he whined to God. I'm the only one left. But God said, no, Elijah, you're wrong. I want you to remember. I want to give you a reminder. I still have 7,000 others who have not bowed their knees to Baal. You're not alone. Isolation can become an enemy of the soul. And when we think we are all alone, we begin to give up hope. We even begin to doubt God. Jesus says, remember, they have treated my other followers just like you. The writer of Hebrew reminds us of the grandstands of heaven are filled with those who have gone before us. They are watching and cheering us on from the finish line. Hebrews 12:1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Number four is this, you are blessed because of persecution's reward. The first half of verse 12 says this, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. The promise of this beatitude is the promise of heaven. For those who have been treated unjustly, for those who have been maligned, those who have been falsely accused, those who have been beaten, bruised, betrayed, tortured, or even killed, their reward is heaven. If through persecution you are going to receive the blessing of God's kingdom, you are re you, your reward is heaven, but you must meet God's requirements. Now understand, I'm not, I'm not talking about earning a place in God's kingdom. We can do nothing to earn God's favor or his blessing. We've been opening each one of the Beatitudes over the last eight weeks, and in each case, there was a step that needs to be taken in order to live a life like Christ. And each step requires an action that draws us closer to Christ. Standing up in the face of persecution is never easy, but it is easier when you keep the reward in full view. The kingdom of heaven will be ours if we don't give up and quit. Keep your eyes fixed on the prize ahead of you. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, For our light and momentary troubles, say that again, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The New Living Testament version says that the troubles that we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. Let's keep the prize we have to gain always in our sight. In this way, we will be blessed, and it will keep us to make the right response to any persecution we may face. So how do we respond to persecution? We're not suffering the same type of persecution that the early Christians faced in the Colosseums, thankfully. But we never know what the future may hold. So how do we respond to, to the type of persecution we are facing now? Well, sometimes we simply need to leave. We're not promised a blessing if we go looking for trouble. None of us need to develop a martyr complex. Sometimes our best course of action is to do the same thing that Joseph did when he was faced with Potiphar's wife and just flee. Jesus gave us examples of having the wisdom and discernment to know when it was best to leave. 
On one occasion in John 8, a mob wanted to stone Jesus to death, but he, he left. Another time in Matthew 12, Jesus knew the Pharisees were plotting to have him killed, so he left and withdrew to another area. And likewise, the Apostle Paul understood when it was time to escape because he was lowered in a basket from the city wall in Damascus. Sometimes the best answer to escape persecution is just leave. The second one is this, we need to guard against compromise. We need to guard against compromise. As we said, one way to end per, er, persecution is to become like those who would oppose you. And we need to remember we are called to please and obey God and not men. Peter and John were ordered to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus, but their response should be the same as ours. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eye, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. Paul understood how compromise can take many different forms, but the motive is the same. Compromise seeks to escape possible persecution brought on by taking a stand for Christ. Galatians 6.12 says, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to impel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. We live in a culture of compromise that's trying to change the way we think. They're trying to challenge the very existence of right and wrong. They're trying to say that sin is okay when scripture clearly says that it's not. And I'm going to try really hard to restrain myself from jumping up on a soapbox, but ladies and gentlemen, we need to wake up. You and I need to wake up and realize that every day our culture is trying to change things. And I'm not opposed to change. But when change takes us further from God's truth, God's plan, and God's way, then we better wake up and realize that we're walking away from God instead of drawing closer to God, and that's the wrong direction. And if we continue to do that, there will be no reward in heaven. So sometimes we just need to leave. We need to guard ourselves against compromise. We need to love our enemies. It's easy to think of a way to get even when somebody has hurt you or those you love. We can be very quick to begin to scheme our retaliation against those who have wronged us, but that's not God's desire. God wants us to love our enemies and break the cycle of revenge. And instead of lashing out with anger, we're called by God to love those who mistreat us. In Romans 12, 17 through 21, we find these words that says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And then the last way, we should pray for those who persecute us. The bottom line is simple. Hurting people hurt other people. The person who injures you is often the victim of a personal pain that may be buried and forgotten. And they attack others that, that in the same way they have been hurt. And likewise, many of those who may be the source of persecution are not believers. They're people who need Christ. Jesus challenged the thinking of his day, and his teaching is still radically different from what many people believe today. Matthew 5, 43 and 44 says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
It's hard to love people that are not lovable. Prayer helps us to love the unlovable people in our lives. Likewise, we are powerless to change people. However, prayer does more than change things. Prayer changes people. Why should we love and pray for those who mistreat and abuse us? They are not our real enemies. Ephesians 6.12 says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The Beatitudes, building blocks to be like Jesus. These are the attitudes, the qualities, the characteristics which produce in us a Christ-like lifestyle. The Beatitudes, they're paradoxical statements of joy. Christ offers us a blessed happiness this world and circumstances cannot take away from us. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Beatitudes bring us into a life of peace. Peace in this life and in the life to come. They are the stones and the steps that we as believers build our life in Christ upon. And I pray that this teaching over the last eight weeks has been one to encourage you, but I also pray that it is one to challenge you and cause us to look at ourselves reflectively and say, are those stones, are those steps a part of who I am? Do I have those within me? Are they a part of me? And if they're a part of me, then I should look a lot more like Christ. Jesus started off this Sermon on the Mount with these Beatitudes, with these statements, and I believe he did that in a way to let the people know that if they wanted to be like him, if they wanted to live the life that he desired them and us to live, these are the eight Beatitudes that must be within us. I pray that they are within you. Would you stand with me? Lord, we come to you right now and we ask, Lord, that you will just take this series, these messages, and Lord, that you will continue to have them play over and over again in our minds. That Lord, that we will look at these steps, these, these attitudes that you have given us, and in order to be like you, in order to live a life that is pleasing to you, they must be a part of us. And Lord, I pray for all of us. I, I pray that as we've gone through this series that, there, that it has been something that has challenged us. Something that has caused us to stop and think and say, is that a part of my life? And if not, is it, how do I get that? How do I make that a part of who I am? For I believe in order to withstand this last Beatitude, this one about persecution. All the rest have to be a part. 
because persecution is hard. Persecution means we have, are going to have to stand up in, in the face of everyone else who is telling us that we're wrong. And we have to believe in something that the world is not going to believe in. But we have to believe, Lord, that you are there with us. You are there providing for us. And Lord, your way is perfect. So Lord, I just pray for each and every person and part of this congregation, those who are watching at home, those who are going to hear this, this passage some other time and another, and another time of the week. And Lord, that you will just continue to speak to us. Lord, may we live our lives as you direct us to. May these beatitudes be a part of every one of our lives. And Lord, if they are, then we will live a life of peace and we will have the reward of being with you in heaven. So Lord, we thank you. We just ask now that you would release us with your benediction and your blessing to God, that you would travel with us throughout this week, that you would keep us safe and that you would bring us all back together so that we may worship you again next week. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great week. God bless.